not everyone talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I want to first, Dr. Anna, welcome you to our first webinar with Repro Clinic. Okay. And I want you to introduce yourself, you know, it's better that you tell us about yourself, what was your inspiration to become a gynecologist and also what was your inspiration to go and work specifically in the field of fertility? Okay, so yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, uh, um, as you said, I'm Anna Boskulen. I'm a gynecologist and specialized in infertility treatments. And, um, and I've been working doing that for some years. Um, and from the beginning, when I chose to do um, gynecologist, Mm -hmm. um, actually, I wanted to do this from the beginning because um, I have had some personal history, not with me, but with my family, uh, someone that uh, has, has needed to, to, to do some uh, fertility treatments and that has gone through all this. And that's something that I always had in my mind. And that's the reason why I, I choose to do that, uh, because I think it's a very beautiful field and to help people to have uh, their families. So that's, uh, that was one of my main yeah, inspiration, I think. So, well, I don't know uh, if you want to ask me something else, uh, we can maybe start to explain. Yes, we, we can go on and move on with our questions. It's uh, very clear what you just mentioned. A lot of doctors in this area get inspired by close cases or sometimes even themselves. So, so that's uh, so nice and beautiful to know because it, kind of, in my opinion, gives um, brings the person, you as a, as a doctor, with kind of more sensitivity and compassion and the ability to help others with that emotional side that this journey can bring to us. Mm -hmm. So yes, I have a few questions that I'm sure our audience uh, always have. And sometimes, I will say even most of the times, we don't ask, and I say we don't ask because I went through pregnancy loss myself, miscarriage and stillbirth, because we feel like uh, embarrassed or whatever it is, sometimes we don't know. Um, so when a patient has suffered a miscarriage or pregnancy loss, what would be the causes? They always ask themselves, you know, because our body, our organs are so different. So what genetic causes could be and no genetics that could cause a pregnancy loss and I know there is masculine and feminine yeah 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 so first of all I would like to explain you what uh, recurrent pregnancy loss is mm -hmm. uh, and the definition of that is having two losses two or more losses of pregnancies uh, before uh, 24 weeks of pregnancy okay mm -hmm. and it doesn't include uh, the ectopic pregnancies so the pregnancies that are outside the uterine cavity or are there specific cases like a molar pregnancy in others, okay? Saying that, what are the causes that we need to think about uh, when we face that problem? First of all, will be, I would say, the most important case would be the genetic one, okay? Mm -hmm. So the thing is that we know that um, in most of the cases of uh, pregnancy loss, we have a problem in uh, the karyotype of the embryo that has been created. Mm -hmm. And this uh, leads to a, a loss of the pregnancy. And why can this uh, happen, this pregnancy loss and this abnormal karyotype of the embryo? It could be in one hand because we have uh, an, uh, more age. So it was related with uh, the age of the, of the mother. Okay. What we know is that uh, women are born with a specific ovarian reserve and this decreases with age. And also the quality of the eggs will decrease with age mm -hmm. more after the 37 years and more after 40 years. And that makes it more difficult to get pregnant. And uh, it increases when you get pregnant, it increases the risk of having a loss uh, related to this quality of the eggs that has been uh, has gone down okay yes. that would be the most important uh, part and uh, most seen and demonstrated we have also uh, it could be because some of the parents carry uh, an abnormal karyotype so that would be another option this is more rare it's not something that we normally see but of course it's something it's something that would happen so in some cases, uh, the parents have their 
all the information that is required. They have the, the chromosomes that are required, but maybe they have a piece of a chromosome that is in another part that is like a translocation, and that's mm -hmm. it, a translocation or inversions or other problems. And that means that they have the information, the genetic information that they need, but this information is placed differently. And then when we create the gametes, the oocyte and the spermatozoid, what we know is that we have to uh, divide the information that we have, the characters that we have, the genetic information has to be divided into two because we have to create uh, gametes with half of the information that are going to mix with the half of the information of the other gamete, okay? And in this process, uh, when we have uh, problems with the karyotypes of the parents, uh, we could have problems uh, with this division of the material and then some gametes could be created, uh, so some oocytes or spermatozoids could be created with less uh, chromosomes that should or more chromosomes that it should and that could lead to pregnancy losses or more difficulty to uh, get pregnant. Okay. Well, yes, that, would be, that would be the, the more important, I mean, the genetic part, which is the well, dem well demonstrated and uh, is uh, most of the cases are related with that, okay? This is one part. And then we have other cases, so um, causes. Um, the second thing that I wanted to, to talk about is the uterine factor. So we have to make sure that the uterus is correct, that we don't have any problem in the, in the uterine cavity or in the uterus that could affect uh, the pregnancy that could lead to uh, miscarriages. Uh, we have seen that uh, there are some congenital abnormalities like septic uterus or T-shaped uterus that could lead to problems with pregnancies. Mm -hmm. uh, normally the shape of the uterine cavity needs to be like a triangle, but we can have like a, there's a, a band of tissue inside it and that would be a septic uterus. And this band of tissue is going to give problems to get pregnant and if you get pregnant and embryo implants on that size, uh, it's not well vascularized and it can lead to a miscarriage. Okay, so it's something that we have to, to look for. And there we have the other part, the endometrial polyps, deep endometrial polyps that could affect uh, submucosal fibroids that could also affect the uterine cavity and, and give some problems. And also the uterine adhesions. Okay, that are uh, created after a surgery of the uterine cavity. Okay, mm -hmm. that would be the uterine part. There's another little part inside the uterine part, which is the chronic endometritis, which is the inflammation of the endometrium. Um, we need more research on that. Uh, we think that it's more related with implantation failure, but it could have some impact in, uh, in some case of miscarriages, yeah. but still we need more research on that. Okay, third part would be the thrombophilia. What is that? So uh, we know that in our body, when we bleed, when, when there's a damage of the tissue, we bleed, and then a uh, clot is formed to uh, stop the bleeding, okay? And when the tissue is repaired, this clot needs to disappear with the fibrinolysis with the other part of the system, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have... Uh, we need to have a good balance between the procoagulation and the fibrinolysis, okay, the, both systems. The problem when we have a thrombophilia is that we have more risk of having a blood clot or risk of with coagulation, and this can lead to problems with uh, miscarriages or pregnancy losses in the first trimester, second trimester, or third trimester. So it's something that we normally look at. Um, what is uh, well demonstrated is uh, when, we, when we diagnose an antiphospholipid syndrome, which is a specific mm -hmm. thrombophilia that is acquired, we can treat it and it, it, it has a, an impact on the pregnancy loss. That's something that has been uh, well demonstrated. And we know also that there are some other thrombophilias that could affect like uh, the inherited thrombophilia, so you are born with them. Mm -hmm. like uh, mutation of prothrombin, uh, factor Leiden, and others that we can look at. Okay, that would be the third part of the uh, causes of, of recurrent pregnancy loss. And then we have uh, other parts like uh, the metabolic part, the metabolic problems, so general mm -hmm. health. That would be, um, for example, 
uh, TSH levels that should be correct, um, uh, vitamin D levels that uh, we need to correct normally. It's not clear if, if it uh, really uh, um, has an impact with uh, pregnancy loss, but we know that um, we can treat it easily, the vitamin D, and it can have uh, an impact on complications during the pregnancy. So it's something that we look at normally mm -hmm. and we treat. And there's another part, which is the hyperprolactinemia, which is controversial. It's not very clear if high levels of prolactin could affect and, and give a miscarriage. It's, it's something that is not well demonstrated. Uh, and the last thing, uh, it would be the insulin resistance, which is also a little bit controversial and goes related with, um, with ovarian polycystic syndrome, for example, and other kind of patients, okay? And this could have an impact, but it's not well demonstrated if we can treat it and it would be a better outcome. Some other thing would be um, the male factor that would mm -hmm. affect also because it's also important, of course. Um, <laughs> And it has been seen that, for example, the DNA fragmentation of the spermatozoids mm -hmm. uh, could affect also to the recurrent miscarriage. Okay, that is one part. And um, the other thing that I wanted to, to talk about is, for example, also the body mass index. Okay, so we need to have a normal weight, which is very important, okay, for uh, male and female, for both. Um, and it is uh, related with a higher risk of miscarriage. Actually, we know that, for example, in women with a higher uh, BMI than 30, uh, they have a higher risk of, of uh, miscarriage. Okay? So we recommend them to try to uh, normalize the weight, okay? And with help, uh, with emotional help, with uh, nutritional help, yes. because it's not so easy as, as it seems sometimes. And the last thing, last post that I wanted to talk about is the immune part. I'm not going to enter in that because it's very difficult and we work with immunologists and that's yes. all really hard. But of course, the thing is that uh, what you need to know is that um, to have an embryo implanted, uh, the body needs to tolerate it. So we need an Im Im an tolerance, an immunological tolerance yes. to make this embryo implant and to invade uh, the endometrium and clay create the decidua, which is the, what um, after we form the placenta. So we know that the immune system is very uh, important, uh, but this needed more research because we need more consensus. So some uh, centers will do some tests and will treat it in one way, other centers will do it in another way. So what is needed is more research on that and more consensus on the immunological implications that we know that it is important as well, okay? That would be more or less the main uh, causes of, of uh, recurrent pregnancy loss. Mm -hmm. Yes, you mentioned basically all of them and uh, you know, I wanted to make like a point, a comment on that. I, uh, my, we had two, two losses. One was in the third uh, trimester, like you mentioned, and it was uh, related to blood clotting. I got um, diagnosed after the loss with the phospholipid issue. Yeah. Uh, it was 30, I was 39 weeks. The, the baby was normal. And then blood clotting, umbilical cord, you know, and then it was, it was very uh, strange because my first IVF, I had my daughter normally. I don't know, probably this developed through what you say, you know, the age, I was 37 when I was doing that, uh, that IVF. And then for my last IVF, I was put on the 22nd week in um, blood thinners, yeah. you know, and like you say, every clinic has a different method. It was Lovenox up to almost close to the due date that it was supposed to be programmed. Then they change it to Eparin because it's all, it's also delicate and, you know, specific that doctors like you need to be careful because if a woman is on that kind of blood thinners, you know, you don't know if eventually you could need a C-section. I didn't, but they prepare for everything, you know, so it says, you need to change from this to heparin in case because it can bleed, the blood is, but it's incredible how medicine have been advanced today 
then we can avoid all of that. Of course, 15 years ago, when I started, there was not much as today. It still was advanced. And I think through the years, it advanced much more. So I wanted, when you say uh, phospholipid, it's just like took me back. And oh, I'm like, yeah. you know, I wish in that time they could have that. So mm -hmm. now you know all the possible genetic causes that can cause recurrent pregnancy loss and miscarriage. Now, as a doctor and as a team member of a fertility clinic like ReproClinic, what medically you can uh, do to detect the cause of the abortion? What medically can be done? Mm -hmm. Once a woman or once a couple have had a, a loss, stillbirth, abortion, then what is the next step to give them kind of an answer? What was the cause of the abortion, of the mm -hmm. miscarriage? Mm -hmm. So the first part would be looking at the genetics, right? Because it's yes. the main problem. So I would recommend to have cardiotypes of both to make sure that everything is correct. And then um, in these cases, it would, would be very interesting to know the fetal cardiotype. So to know the cardiotype of the miscarriage, if it's possible. Uh, of course, it's something that it's not always possible, but if it's possible, if we can test that, we can make sure that it's not the embryo or that it is the embryo and the genetics of the embryo that is not correct, right? Before looking at uh, the next things, more things um, that we could look at. So for the uterine factor, uh, I would recommend an ultrasound, even a 3D ultrasound, uh, and even a hysteroscopy, which is looking with a camera inside the uterine cavity to make sure that everything uh, is correct and maybe to take some uh, biopsy uh, to rule out some specific factors that could affect okay so that would be the part of the uterine factor more things that we could look at of course a blood test general health blood test the general blood test of, uh, to see everything that everything is correct that there's no nothing else that we have missed and of course, I would ask for uh, thrombophilias. Okay, so as I told you, so antiphospholipid syndrome, prothrombin imagination, and others. Okay, so that would be the uh, main steps and the main things that we should look at. Okay, of course, in some specific cases, we would look at other things and other kind of uh, tests, like endometrium specific endometrium tests. Um, it has been said that there could be. Uh, correlation uh, between the bacteria that are inside the, the fluid of the endometrial fluid inside mm -hmm. the uterine cavity, and that if we have a good percentage uh, percentage of lactobacillus, that we have a good uh, percentage of, of a good pregnancy. Okay, it is more related with implantation, but it is being said that it could have an impact on, for example, biochemical pregnancies, biochemical miscarriages, which is yes. when we have a positive test and soon later, we, soon after we have a loss and we yes. have not seen any, any ultrasound, any, any, anything in the ultrasound, okay, that would be a biochemical pregnancy. So this is a specific part that we could look at, but in some specific cases, um, it's more secondary, I would say. And of course, the immunological part, which would be for me doing a, a visit with our immunologist and, uh, and let's, let's uh, make a big uh, uh, history of everything. Let's uh, check everything and, and then maybe do some specific tests for immunology. Definitely, I think that all these tests uh, can avoid for that couple, for that women, for that, you know, parents to be. Uh, to uh, upcoming recurring mess, uh, you know, pe pregnancy loss and miscarriages. Now, you mentioned something very interesting that one of the causes that could lead to pregnancy loss is um, the chromosomal issues with the embryo. So if you find out, if a clinic and you as a doctor find out that the cause of the miscarriage, of the loss, it's in some kind of issues with the chromosomic uh, part of the embryo. What could be the, uh, the alternatives? What could be the next step forward for, uh, you know, for helping this couple, to helping this woman, you know, in the mm -hmm. next treatment mm -hmm. to avoid that? Uh -huh. So I think the, may, the, the thing that we could do 
would be looking at the genetics of the embryo before mm -hmm. putting the embryo back in the uterine cavity. So that's the PGT test, the genetic test of the embryo. So looking at the chromosomes of the embryo and make sure that the embryos are correct before putting them back and then to avoid this or an implantation failure or a, a miscarriage or a pregnancy loss. Um, but of course, it's, this is to, to select the embryos. It's something that we could do to select the embryos, but it's not going to change. Uh, if we have embryos with a problem, with a genetic problem, it's not going to change. We have no way to change it, but we can look at it and then select just the embryo that is correct and don't do, I don't know, yes. four uh, transfers and have bad outcomes and lose time and money and emotionally. It's also... Uh, very important if you are doing just transfers and transfers. It would be better if we have a lot of embryos to select them better and, and put just the one that is correct. Okay, that would be uh, very useful in those cases. Yes, yes, definitely. And I think that that's one of the things that in the past, before all the medicine adv advances like we have now, we had it before, there was a lot of women, you know, going through so many multiple cycles and they didn't, or for whatever reason, there was no PGT test. And now it's incredible. I can see, for example, that a lot of transfers, they transfer only one embryo and there is successful pregnancies, not only positive tests, but they end up with a baby in their arms. In, you know, 15 years ago when I did, it was less, we put four because you wanted, and there was no PGT testing, you know, there was not that kind of thing. So multiple cycles now today are avoid thanks to that. Now, in, in because I know that probably our audience will say, okay, but what is PGT testing? You know, it's so much medical language. Uh, how you can explain what it is? Yes, it's checking the embryo, but mm -hmm. what checks on the embryo um, mm -hmm. that test? Mm -hmm. So what we do is uh, we create the embryo. So the, egg, the day of the egg retrieval, we fertilize the eggs with, uh, with the sperm sample. Then we wait for some days, normally five days, to mm -hmm. the stage of blastocyst, in which uh, we have an embryo that has uh, like two parts, an external part and an internal part. That's the uh, body mass. Uh, and then we take a biopsy. So we take a little piece of some cells of the external part to analyze it, okay, to see how the chromosomes are. And then we have to freeze those embryos. So we do the biopsy, we freeze them because we need uh, three weeks more or less to have the results, okay? And then once we know uh, how the results are and which embryo is correct, then we can, with the next menstruation, we can start the preparation and program the embryo transfer. Oh, that, that's, it's incredible how, you know, how the, the advance in medicine and how, is, how powerful it is. You know, I, I usually say to anyone going through IVF, I know it's, it's very stressful. I know it's emotional, but at the same time, you know, when I was going through that, I was looking into, okay, I wish I could get pregnant naturally. But even naturally pregnancies, a lot of women that get pregnant naturally, they also suffer from recurring pregnancy loss and they don't know what it is. And they think that because they can get pregnant naturally, nothing is wrong with them. And look at this, it could be something that from both parts or even the embryo has a genetic issue and it's beautiful. So when I was looking into it, I was like, okay, so I am the closest to God to see how the process works to give some kind of a little cheer up and go ahead with it. Thank you so much. That's a very interesting point. Now, what percentage of the patients in um, consultation come to you that suffer for a recurring pregnancy loss, uh, Dr. Anna, in your clinic? I would say like uh, two to 5% of the couples will have that kind of problem, recurring pregnancy loss. Um, yeah, I would say that number more or less. Uh, okay. Be the, the the number of of couples that will have that could have this problem. Mm -hmm. yes. it's not very normal, as you see. It's not something. Yes, it's a low percentage. Yeah, it's low uh, low percentage, but still, it's something that is there, right? So, yes. Yes, definitely. So, um, basically, that was kind of the questions that I wanted to ask you because we want our audience want to know more about, you know, the main causes. You went into detail in our first question, 
And then what happened when the embryo is the one that, you know, that, that calls that. Um, if there is anything that you want to add, please feel free to do it. Um, well, I, I, will, I, I would say something um, about the treatment or the things that we can do. Mm -hmm. I normally counsel the patients to, do, to have a healthy style life. So that would be one very important thing. Uh, as, I, as I told you already, um, to try to normalize the, the body mass index, the weight, mm -hmm. okay? And try to avoid, of course, the smoking, alcohol, all these kind of things that could affect. And then, um, of course, what we will do is we will try to maximize the chances. If you, you need vitamin D, if you need a little bit of supplement for the thyroid, we will give um, everything that we think that could help. And in some specific cases, we will give uh, aspirin, uh, heparin. Yes. Uh, when we see that it's needed, it's required, then it can help, of course. Um, and in other specific cases, we could also think about, of course, when we see something in the uterus, we can treat it with a, with a surgical hysteroscopy. If we see, like I told you, like that, that band of tissue, yes. the septate uterus, it's something that we can treat with a hysteroscopy. And uh, on the other hand, related with the, with the part of um, a manufacturer, I would say that we could also use some specific tests to, um, to, to have a better sperm selection. Okay. Yes. So be, yes. Yeah. Okay, that's, uh, that's incredible. One of the things that I wanted also to put a little bit on the part is that uh, besides being all the medical part, like the main thing, we also combine the emotional part. And you know, doctor, that, you know, I'm, as a partner yes. with Repro Clinic, I mm -hmm. am there for that mm -hmm. part. Yes, the, the patients have a very complicated history and a lot of stress and then, yeah, something very important. It's emotionally very, very important for the patient. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if well, there is anyone that has questions for uh, Dr. Anna, I will be posting this webinar in our Facebook group. Uh, she's going to post it also in uh, the group of Repro Clinic in Facebook. I'll try also to put it into my Instagram and I will tag uh, the clinic with your name so they can ask more questions because I'm sure, you know, there is so many different stories and, uh, and each, each journey is different. You know, I can have the situation with the blood clotting issue. Uh, there is the chromosomic issue and all of that. Yeah, that's, that's right. And well, I, I wanted to ask you also, um, you as a specialist in the emotional part, yes. emotional treatment, um, how do you approach these patients? So what do you recommend normally to do with this, that kind of, of patients? Yes, well, Dr. Anna, you know, like uh, like I was mentioning to you in the beginning, you know, 15 years ago, the, when, when the advance of medicine was not so strong as it is today, and even, you know, social media was not as booming as it is now, so that emotional support was very difficult to find. Um, I will definitely think that uh, that is the missing link between the patients and the clinic, and I love the fact that the clinic is doing that. You guys kind of match that part and say, okay, we have this medical, but we need all of that. So I am there for, uh, you know, that emotional part. How I can approach that? I think that one of the main things that I feel confident in approaching that to someone that has gone to recurrent pregnancy loss is the fact that I myself went through it in two different ways. I went through it in a very advanced stage of my pregnancy at 39 weeks. And the cause definitely was determined phospholipid issue. And then right after that, because of course, emotionally, I was totally, you know, unstable. And, and the thing that we want to do is like fill up that hole. You know, I wanted that baby because I thought that maybe that baby is the only thing that is going to take me away from that pain. So basically, I will say month and a half later, I went through another IVF, which Obviously, the clinic and the doctors didn't recommend it because emotionally I was not prepared. But anyway, you know, we did it. And I drilled the poor doctors. They, they didn't have a choice. I put them against the wall. You do it, that's it. And then because of that reason, my body was not prepared. I didn't enter into 
that care that doctors offer in the sense of prepare, see what vitamins I need, maybe put me into blood thinners before. So I had a miscarriage at seven weeks. So both of them, no matter what the time it is, I went through it. So I think that by being there with someone that have recurring, you know, recurring lost pregnancies, and along with the clinic, with you as, as doctors, it's a big support and it can be a preparation to the next step and even be part of a positive outcome to increase that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that will be, you know, like my suggestion. And it's always good to have um, that emotional part. And I always think that the best option is to have someone that have gone through that situation. So mm -hmm. it's someone that can see what is going on. Mm -hmm. And would you recommend the patients to follow um, also a little bit of emotional support to have that, that kind of support during the treatments as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you see, when, when I did my last IVF, even though I start all my meditations and all of that, there is always a PTSD. I will say that we can have a post-traumatic disorder in the sense of what a pregnancy loss is, is traumatic. So even though we can enter into a new cycle with having all the medical tests done and the doctors have known what to do to avoid it because they found out what happened, that emotional support is very important. Why? Because if it's um, a field birth, like in my case, the first loss, when the baby, let's see the, the couple start a new treatment, they get pregnant, everything is going perfect but they had in the past a stillbirth. When the baby start to move, our mind start to go to bad places. What if it happens again? What, so, you know, it's, it's a little bit of back in, back, back flash into that situation. And our emotions and our thoughts that they are negative cause stress, you know, our hormone of stress can go up and, and, and that can affect us physically. So mm -hmm. definitely having someone during that time, especially when it comes to the uh, starting the second, third trimester, having mm -hmm. someone there telling you, listen, it's going to be okay. Reminding that person that doctor did everything. They did the test. They put the right embryos. It's, and of course, it's, it's good to allow to, to take up. Mm -hmm. You have someone that you're going to tell, okay, I feel this. I feel that. I run away. If the baby's not moving, happens to me drink juice, eat chocolate. I want to keep that baby moving, it happens to me. So it is definitely something that can help. And Reproclinic offer that along with the treatments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's important. Yeah, it's very important. Very, that very is. much. <laughs> it is. Yeah, 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 with these flashes and everything. I, I mean, I think a pregnancy loss is worse than having a negative beta test. Of course, every every case is different, eh? but yeah, when you have a positive beta test and then you have your, your expectations and you think about uh, the future and everything, and then you have a loss, it's uh, very difficult, I think, for the patients. It is, and I think that one of the things that most couples and women that go through pregnancy loss, especially after a treatment, a medical treatment, is we must learn and take the time to grieve and don't do the mistake that I did, that is jumping right away into another treatment because we need to fill that, uh, that hole of the baby. Grieving is very important and grieving it, it involves the, neg you know, the fact that we are in, in negation, we, we cannot believe it, and we must go through all that steps and feelings to get to a point that we get to acceptance of what happened, it's very difficult, uh, not forgetting, and then be prepared mentally and emotionally to go into the next step or into the next cycle. I didn't grieve my stillbirth, and that's why I am big, you know, like, I think that one of the biggest causes of my miscarriage afterwards was that part, not grieving, because emotionally I was totally a wreck. And then medically they could do everything. I, I had good eggs, I had everything, but I miscarried because I was not prepared. I was still with that and I didn't grieve. So it's very important. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Well, I don't know if, if we have some questions of the audience or not. 
we have one of our participants, and I'm sure that the others that subscribe or re uh, register to the webinar will uh, come and uh, add questions. I want to ask, let me unmute you, Anna, for a second. Joanna, do you have any question? Let me chat to her. Do you have any extra question for the manner? Because we don't want to leave anyone with any doubts. In the meantime, while she answers, so I want to remind our audience that we will put all the links in my YouTube channel, in the Facebook page, in Instagram, and of course we will share it in Retro Clinic. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems that she doesn't. So, Dr. Anna, it was amazing to have you. I really thank you very much for no. inviting. No, no, no. And I tell you something. I hope to continue having this um, webinar with you on the theme of um, Retro Clinic. We coordinate them all with Esther and Anna. Everyone knows that we start with this 2021, kicking off with these health things. We know that a lot of uh, couples have gone through 2020, you know, canceling cycles. Hopefully everything is gonna be much better this year. And we will be here with Dr. Anna and with all the team of Reproclinic doing more webinars. I think the next one that we have together is in July. Yes, I think so. July or June? I'm not June, sure. No. June, June, June. We move it to June. Yes, I think. We still have to set the date, me and Dr. Anna, because we are a little bit with our own uh, family schedules, but we will let you know. Okay, Dr. Anna, thank you so much. And again, if much. there is any questions, we will tag Reproclinic and you will come free, you know, free to answer or I email you too, okay? Thank okay. you everyone to be here and we hope to see you again. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.